Welcome to a new series of the Dissidents Podcast with your co-hosts, Jennifer Richmond and Brandy Shuvatinsky. In this series, we explore the radical roots of liberated ethnic studies, how extreme ideology is infiltrating our schools and the aim to indoctrinate instead of educate, and our search for solutions to empower parents, teachers, and students, giving them the tools to embrace inquiry and to express their individuality. Hi, and welcome to another edition of our Ethnic Studies series, The Radical Roots of the Dissidents podcast with myself, Jennifer Richmond, and co-host Brandy Shubatinsky. We have a special guest today, Kofi, and I'm going to let Brandy do the honors of introducing us. So Brandy, take it away. Sure. Hi, Jen. Hi, Kofi. It's uh, great to be here with you both. Um, so Kofi Monska is a wife, mom, and attorney. She holds a bachelor's degree in law and diversity from Western Washington University and a Juris Doctorate uh, from Hamline University School of Law. She's part of Take Charge and the Exodus Minnesota organizations that seek to make a difference through faith, family, and education. Welcome, Kofi. We're really excited that you're here uh, speaking with us about your experience in Minnesota with ethnic studies and with the state and, and education as a whole. Thank you. It Kofi, you have an interesting story. Some people probably know your name because you actually spoke up. You want to tell us a little bit, give us some background from those of us who don't know how you got into this scene. Well, there's two incidents. Once I, once I spoke at a school board meeting about a year, year and a half ago, and that went viral. And then um, recently maybe this winter or spring, I spoke at a legislative hearing on an ethnic studies bill that they were considering passing and did pass in Minnesota. So I spoke against the bill. Can you tell us a little bit why and tell everyone who's listening a little bit um, about why you were against the bill in, in Minnesota? Well, I was against the bill. I was gonna pull out parts of the bill that I have written here, but, um, I just thought the, the ethnic studies bill, while it might have had good intentions, was going to be very, very harmful to kids of color. Um, you know, in their definition of ethnic studies, they talk about a caste system in the United States based on immutable characteristics like race, which we do not have a caste system based on race. And I don't think kids should be taught that. Um, they, they talk about how, um, they talk about like in their definition of anti-racism, they talk about redistributing wealth, and that's basically their definition of anti-racism, which I do not believe is helpful to pit kids against each other. And so anyways, in general, I just thought that that the bill, while maybe well intended, uh, was basically going to tell kids of color that the systematic racism existed in this country and that because of it, they weren't going to be able to achieve. And I didn't want that type of message going out to my kids or any kids of color. No, thank you. I know that um, uh, people are probably a lot more aware of what's happening in California regarding ethnic studies. They may not be aware of what's going on in other states. Before you saw this come to Minnesota, were you um, aware of any of, this is any of the issues around ethnic studies in, in California? I was not. I was not aware of the issues in California. And I had been really involved in politics and working on school choice and all of that. And I kind of took a break for a bit and I intentionally took a break because I was getting overwhelmed. And so when someone came to me and told me about this bill in Minnesota, I said, oh, I'm not going to talk about it. But then after I read the bill, I, I said, I, I have to speak on this bill. And they told me about it like the afternoon before the hearing. So I, I prepped in one night for the hearing and got up and spoke the next morning because I was so upset by what I saw. No, it's interesting you say that. I think a lot of um, activists are really relying on parents not knowing what's happening um, in their local district level and also at the state level. And it, it's interesting that, you know, most most people aren't aware of that how, how this is spreading, where it's coming from or the ideology behind it, because you hear ethnic studies and you think one thing, and then you look through something like the bill or a district policy and discover a lot of times it's an entirely different thing like redistribution of wealth is part of being anti-racist mm -hmm, definitely a lot of parents don't know and then a lot of everything they do is kind of guised as being positive but really it has the opposite effect in the end 
Kofi, that's a question I have for you. Like Brandy said, so many parents don't really know what it is that they're looking at. Obviously, you know, you, you mentioned, you just said someone gave you the bill beforehand. Like, how do you get involved to the point where, I mean, how would, as a regular parent, you would get that bill and be able to read it in the first place? I and mean, what, what is it that you are doing that kind of puts you in the mix that maybe other parents could learn from? Um, well, I gotten to know lots of people just in the scene who are you know legislators who are working on this stuff and once you get to know someone they'll call you they'll ask for help they will educate they'll help educate you but I've I've just gotten involved in organizations that work to improve education and I've also gotten involved with my local my local schools and so I I had been involved on a state level speaking and trying to pass legislation and then I decided you know I need to go to my local school district and see what I can do there. And I went to one school board meeting and I ended up meeting all of these people. So um, now we're running, I'm a campaign manager, running people for school board. And when they allowed public comments at school board meetings, which they have now shut down, um, I did speak at a lot of school board meetings and they were televised. And I tried to do so to, you know, to persuade the school board members, but also to educate the public on, on what's going on with ethnic studies and what's going on in these schools with respect to, to people of color and all of the segregation and lowering of standards. Um, you know, I, I went to school board meetings with specific examples of things that they're doing in the schools. So I, I want to get back to ethnic studies, but you said something that caught my ear. You said that they've shut down public comment at school boards. What, what do you mean? So um, at, in Minnesota, I think in almost every single school district, I think that there was an order that came down. There's like some state level school board association like minnesota school board association i think they instructed all of the schools to do this and so then they all voted unanimously each school board to end public comment and so now for all of the school districts most all of them during the meeting parents cannot parents and community members cannot comment or speak at all if you want to speak you have to give them notice by like three o'clock the day of the meeting and then you go to a meeting before the meeting and talk just to the school board meeting the members and it is not televised. And um, so that's what you do now. And so they have a lack of accountability because nobody can know what we're saying. Um, yeah, and so that's that's what they're doing in Minnesota throughout the whole state. So against that, that sounds very undemocratic and authoritarian. It does. Yeah. And then there's just, it is, but we've looked at the statutes and it's, there's arguments we could make, but it's really hard with the open meeting law because they, they've framed it in such a way that it's not a meeting. I'm sure they've consulted their lawyers on this before mm -hmm. doing it. So there has been some pushback, especially by like a nonpartisan data group in the state, but um, there's not been like any formal litigation or anything on that. But yes, they have shut down public comment. Even outside of the law, outside of, of uh, legal action, it just sounds morally wrong in, in a free and democratic um, society. It sounds like it's it's the opposite. It um, is. But like, honestly, we would go to the school board meetings and beg, and it was kind of insulting. Like we would go there and beg and ask them to make changes and point out things that were going on. And they would just ignore us. And and one of the school board members actually said, you people who come here are people who are, are flat earthers. You believe elements have wings. You believe two plus two is five. And so they just see us as crazed people. And so they, they don't, even when we would speak, it, they wouldn't listen. Right. And so the only benefit is that you would educate the public and then other people could come alongside and try to persuade them. And maybe- well, That's a big benefit though. That I mean, is that's huge. Big shut down. And that's like the whole purpose of the open meeting law and transparency. Mm -hmm. But now because they have shut us out of even making public comment and whining it to them and asking and begging, we said, screw it. Now we're going to run for school board and we're going to get a seat at the table. You know, for so long, we just, just, just assume that our only thing we can do is argue. And it's like, no, we can get involved and we should be where we have a right to be. And so now it's like, fine, shut us out. And now we'll just try to get on the school board. So the first time in many, many years, probably 20 years, these school board members are running a contested case with or a contested you know, hearing when they've never been challenged before. So I've got a question just about, you, you'd mentioned before, I know Brandy wants to get back to ethnic studies, but when you go and you talk to the school boards, 
and you said there were some things that you 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 pointed out. What what to you was the most egregious thing that you've been seeing lately that really kind of spurred you to say not enough, not today? Um, uh, there's been there's been a lot. So I mean, just like of all of the stuff, just in general of the stuff that um that we're seeing in schools. Um, so one of the things was after George Floyd was killed, they had a discussion on race for students in the schools. They had a discussion and they sent out an email to all the parents, and all the students saying we're having a discussion, but the discussions were by race. So if you were one color, you'd go to one room and each by race, you went to a separate room to have the discussion. And so that was segregation, which is bad. Um, another thing they did was they gave a survey to all the kids of color only. So in each class, they said, you know, raise your hand if you consider yourself a person of color. And they handed out a survey to you. And the kids were supposed to fill out the survey. It had information about their mental health, behavior, all of this really personal information. And the school gave this the, the kids data to the University of Minnesota without parental consent and got money in exchange. And so basically selling their data. And it bothered me that they they act like they're helping the kids of color because maybe they were supposed to like use that money to get them counseling or something. But in every effort they say they're trying to help us, really you're segregating us by by calling out the kids of color in a classroom and then and then giving away their private data without parental consent, which is a violation of state law. And you know, every single thing they do, it's hurting us instead of helping us. In um, band class uh, last year. They told my ninth grader that, you know, that because he's black, he will, um, it's not likely that he will live to the age of retirement because he's black. In science class, they um, were, you know, they do a whole unit in ninth grade, for every ninth grader in science class, that pollution is going to kill us. So even the air is after us. And we are such a weak, pathetic race that the air is going to kill us. And these thriving, wonderful, strong white people will somehow live but it's targeting us. And so in the assignment, one of the questions that I have right here is, um, if you are a white student, what did you learn from your classmates who are people of color? Ironically, my son who is black and his friend who is Chinese were the only two people who commented that day and said this assignment was ridiculous and that they have pollution. Right now, our biggest pollution that we have is from 3M. Um, in a, in a very rich area, 3M has polluted the water. And so all these rich white folks are getting sick. So, you know, like my kids pointed things like that out and how there's there's pollution in rural areas and that everyone can be affected. So ironically, when the kids had to answer their assignment, they got to say what my son and his friend said who were people of color. But again, it's just constant segregating us, making us look weak, giving us no hope in the future and, and segregating kids. And it, it really, really bothers me, pitting kids against each other. So those were just some, I mean, even like I met with the superintendent because she sent out some email that bothered me about race. So I met with her for an hour and at the end of the conversation, it's like she heard nothing I said. She just said, you know, I wanna ask you a question. Do you think we should have different standards of behavior for black kids? Because in their families, they're like, oh, and in our families, we're all, you know, contained and they're, you know, black families are a little more raucous. And, and um, so we should have different standards of behavior. And this woman is paid at least $210,000 a year, looked up her salary and that was probably last year's or whatever. But to have someone that say that we should have different standards of behavior based on race and that because of the color of our skin, we can't behave is absolutely ridiculous. In the real world, there's one standard that we all must live to, or we all go to jail or unemployed or, you know, live under a bridge if we can't live up to a certain standard of behavior. And it's just racist to assume that we can't behave because of our skin color. Like I mean, we've heard that before. That sounds like something from the Klan from the 1920s. To, yes. so, so I think that that's being, being vocalized by a school superintendent in the 21st century in Minnesota sounds insane especially when it, it it's coming under the guise of something pro, uh, progressive or or anti-racist mm -hmm. so, so you'd said yeah. something that caught my ear before or wrote something where you talked about um ethnic studies the the bill for critical ethnic studies in minnesota um did you say institutionalizing hopelessness 
and black kids? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't believe that there's some, I mean, I believe there is racism in the world and that there are, there are racist people, but I think a lot of the racism comes from, from the left, you know, and in this we're institutionalizing, we're, we're, we're creating a system in the school system for K through 12th grade where teachers are required to teach kids of color that they're not gonna make it in this world or that they're gonna have extreme challenges or be stuck in a caste system because of the color of their skin. So they are institutionalizing racism. They're making it in the institution of schooling throughout the entire state of Minnesota, teaching kids that based on their color, they're not gonna make it. Teaching white kids that based on their color, they are racist. And so, so yes, so they're, they're the ones. And I still don't think it's a barrier that we can't make it beyond, but they're certainly harming things. So what do you say th like that that struck me because I feel like we know what hopelessness has looked like and does still look like in different um, black American communities. And it's not something that leads, you know, leads to a, a positive, happy and healthy future for, for members of those different communities. So what do you think's behind behind? I know it's, you know, I'm asking you to kind of guess, but what do you think's behind so many schools, so many educators, so many school administrators actually wanting to, to do that and pretend that they're actually trying to help the communities that they're potentially harming? I think a lot of it is white guilt. Like they just feel really guilty for being white and because they have been told by virtue of their skin color and because of what their ancestors may or may not have done, that they are terrible people. And so I think they're doing a lot of it to make themselves feel good because hardly anything they're doing nothing they're doing is actually helping improve outcomes for black kids or any kid of color. It's actually making it worse. And so I think it's just to make themselves feel good. I also think they're kind of putting themselves on us. So like you might have these like white liberal Karens around. My husband and I were just in Florida and we saw this guy with a shirt that said, not today, Karen. And for some reason I could not stop laughing at that stupid shirt. But then it got me thinking, <laughs> not today, Karen. You have all these people who are like very easily offended or more emotional. And then they're kind of telling us what we should be offended by a lot of the times. Like you have all these white people saying we have to remove the name Washington Redskins or, and you have, they, now there's a petition by Native American people saying, bring it back. It acknowledges our culture, who we are, we get to be seen, you know? And so all these white people, it's usually most of the time white people telling us what we should be offended by. And then we just fall in line. And so, and so it makes me really mad. Like as a people, we, if you look at the history of black Americans, like we have a, a history of triumph, of working hard through hard times, succeeding through hard times, having a sense of humor, being tough. And now you have us whining and crying. My kid just told me that in high school, they teach you if you ask to touch a black person's hair or compliment it, you're a racist, you know? And now we're these, now we've got black fragility, you know? So yeah, so it, it really, it, it bothers me. I think they are imputing, you know, doing whatever they can to make themselves feel good. And it's all style over substance and virtue signaling. And in the end, it's not even, the results aren't even neutral. They're actually bad, what they're doing to us. It's actually hurting us as a people of color. Relaxing standards hurts us. Not prosecuting criminals hurts us. We have record number of carjackings, 12 year olds, 14 year olds stealing cars in Minnesota. It's absolutely absurd. Everything they do hurts us. And then like things that would actually help us like the nuclear family, they say that's white. Every being on time, that's white. Anything that could help us is actually hurting us that they think is helping us. Yeah, so, well, part of what I've seen in a lot of um, ethnic studies curricula is the um, support or, or teaching of the Black Lives Matter at schools. I don't know if you've seen that curriculum, but um, it does, it does uh, do a couple of the things you mentioned, like calling the nuclear family um, whiteness and the being on time and all of those those types of things but what do you say to people that that say well okay we need ethnic studies because we want kids to be able to see themselves in the textbooks and the material that they're learning at school well I think it just depends on how you define ethnic studies you know like if you're teaching kids like in this that some the white kids need to give the black kids something and and that the white kids are inherently racist and the black kids are inherently flawless and you're pitting kids against each other that's not that's not an ethnic studies that's helpful 
it just pits kids against each other. It, it makes, it helps them not to get to know each other. And I feel like, um, you know, teaching about the history of this country, I think that's fine. I think that um, teaching ethnic cities in a way that's not divisive, you know, and talking about the differences in culture, but also what we have in common, it will encourage kids to get to know each other. And then the more we get to know each other, we spend time together. That's how you truly teach. That's how you truly get to know. That's how I got to know my friend who is Taiwanese and Chinese and Indian. I, I went to their homes. I ate their food. I hung out with them and their family. There's no way some teacher who's 21 who just graduated from North Dakota University is going to be able to teach every single culture. And then within cultures, people are different. So I kind of think it's a, an impossible endeavor in the first place. And that the way people get to know each other is by, or get to know about each other's ethnicity is, is by getting to know each other. And that this curriculum it encourages them not to. It, it pits them against each other. You had mentioned before, but I, I think it bears repeating. You had you looked over this ethnic studies curriculum. This is what brought you, you know, to the table to speak out about it. What were some of the things that were you again? You, you kind of touched on this, but what were some of the things that were so egregious that you, again, same question as what when you went to the school board that you said, "I cannot stay still. I cannot be quiet. I must go and and speak to this issue." Well, I think it was just, and also just being a lawyer too. I mean, just looking at the plain language of the bill, and I'm like. Oh my word, they're not even trying to hide this terribleness. Like it's right in the plain language of the bill. Like how they talk about a stratification. There's a stratification, you know, a caste system based on race. And and um, they talked about just the plain language, like anti-racist racist means actively working to identify and elim eliminate racism in all its forms so that power and resources are redistributed and shared equitably among all racial groups. They talk about the definition of culturally sustaining. They're gonna infuse culture, language of black people, indigenous people and people of color um, and communities they say who have been and continue and, and continue to be harmed in a race through schooling. And so just like the plain language of the bill was absolutely insane like that they would say that kids of color are harmed through schooling well if we're harmed through schooling and the school's racist what gives you authority to teach anti-racism what gives you any authority at all if you are admitting you are a racist institution and who, who was backing that who was backing the that legislation where did it come from in minnesota well uh, i don't have the name of the group but there's this name of this like this there's a, a community group who was backing this bill and like i don't have minnesota to... ethnic studies now or something like that something like that it was some group based on race kind of like a blm type group that was backing this bill and then they on their website they specifically talk about redistributing wealth and all of that stuff so they were the main um backers but also in this bill they they have um, part of this ethnic studies thing they're doing, they removed suspensions from the entire state of Minnesota that teachers can, or schools cannot suspend students or move them from school. So when I was testifying, there was principals there testifying saying, this is ridiculous that if there's a problem, maybe schools can decide what they're gonna do by school, but to make this a statewide policy. And then after we all spoke, some of the legislators said, yes, this is because we have too many black black kids getting suspended so now we're just going to say nobody can be suspended so that it was egregious like to me. more than it sounds like more than ethnic studies it mm -hmm. sounds like a whole ideology tied to um a radical ethnic studies curriculum that was put as part of that legislation yeah so and it's it's part of their whole movement but it's all based on the fact that people of color can't behave and we're dumb because the other thing they did was remove teacher testing like there was a test to become a teacher and they said we're moving this because we have 300 teachers of color that we want to pass the test who can't pass it so we're just going to remove the the exam and it's was crazy that, because what, what? was that part is that part of that same that same bill that it's same part of the same package like it might be mm. in different places in the bill but it was mm -hmm. all under this ethnic studies thing and it's all by the same committee it was all discussed the day that i was there testifying so it's all kind of the it's all kind of the package and like when you can't suspend like we recently had a school shooting at harding high school in saint paul it's like when you don't remove a student like there's a few crappy black students like there's a few crappy students of all colors 
and ethnicities. But when you don't remove them, you hurt all of the good black kids in the classroom trying to learn. Like they are the ones who don't learn. So you're not helping anyone by doing that, even though they think they're helping by saying, oh, you can't remove them from school. It's the, the, the teachers can't teach the other black kids in the classroom when they do that. And it, it, the removing the, the testing for teachers is actually removing standards for qualified educators to be in the classroom. How, how, who in the world would think that that would help st any student? I don't know, because it, it says that the whole bill is called Excellence in Education. Like that was one of the titles they had when they were. So it just cracks me up that they're talking mm -hmm. about excellence, but yet they're removing, they're removing standards, which I have a huge, I just have a huge problem with removing standards because they're doing it because they think we're stupid. And I have a problem with anybody thinking that people of color are stupid because of their skin color. I have a problem with that. And how are we ever going to prove that we're not if we don't ever take take a test? I mean, I you know? just think how do we prove it? There's no way. There's no way we can respect ourselves or have others respect us if we're not willing to compete on the same playing field as everybody else. I, I see this as it's gone a step farther, where it's not even about competing on the same playing field. It's about not even playing the same game. Mm -hmm. I don't know because I, I'm not I'm not thinking about it in terms of trying students of color trying to prove that they're just as smart as as their white counterparts. But every every field you need you have to meet certain qualifications. You're not going to be able to be a plumber and and reinstall a sink if you aren't qualified to do it. You're not going to be able to be a welder and weld something that's going to be safe and suitable for somebody to use if you if you don't meet a specific standard. Just like you can't be a, a surgeon if you can't pass a certain requirement um, where you're not killing your, your patients. So I don't understand the desire of moving standards in, in the name of, of, you know, diversifying teaching staff, unless they're saying that teachers aren't a profession. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it hurts everyone in the end when you don't have standards. Like all pilots need to, be, need to take an exam and be tested and ensure they're competent. I sure hope you know. so. Yeah. <laughs> and so in doctors and everyone else. So yeah, before they were just removing the standards from people of color and they wanted to do that, but now they want to remove remove the standards from, from everybody, which is bad for every profession and it's bad for the world. And but honestly, if people, if there were a racist person who thought that we were inferior, like or my kids are being taught that, you know, we have to relax standards for you because you're not smart. How do they ever prove it without having the test? Like the white kids, when there is no plumbing exam, might just be trusted if someone really were racist. But if the black kid, yeah. you know, never had the opportunity to prove it, how would someone know? You yeah. know, and so like with, with law school, who knows if I got in from affirmative action or what happened with law school because affirmative action was alive and well until just recently when it's not been, you know, prohibited. But yeah, I wanted to be able to prove myself through taking a bar exam because I wanted to prove it to myself and to everybody else that I was smart enough. I wanted to prove it to my future clients that when they pay $500 for my time, it's worth their time. Yeah. And so, yeah. And so I, and I just think it's insulting to assume that we can't do it. So even when they take it away, it, it, it lowers the standard for the whole profession as you're staying, but it also is extra bad for people of color, I think. It's the bigotry of low expectations. Mm -hmm. And it's pervasive. That's and your stories just really underline what's going on. And I'm so surprised as well with what I would call the pork barreling uh, into this ethnic studies bill of the teacher standards. And then I mean, I don't think we saw that. That's not how it worked in California, right? I mean, ethnic studies was kind of kept in its own well, little box. It's go in California. It's it's there are similar goals, but it's moving differently. It's more step by step. So there actually was a call. It didn't. It didn't pass yet um, to eliminate the testing for new teachers for them to their standardization. That didn't pass. But the excuse given wasn't just there weren't enough teachers of color. The it was that there's a teacher shortage. So in order to resolve the teacher shortage, let's just eliminate the qualifications and anybody can become a teacher. Which again, to me, I'm like, okay. So you're saying that you're doing this to help students of color, but then you're saying that they don't deserve qualified teachers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
that's just yep. one example but yeah in california you're right jen it isn't it, it wasn't like all attached to one uh, piece of legislation, but those very, very, very similar steps are being taken in the state. So, so Kofi, you said that this did pass in Minnesota. So what does that look like? So in California, they have to take, in order to graduate, they have to take an ethnic studies course. What is this, that now that this passed, what does that look for like for you in Minnesota? Well, I'm not exactly sure how it's going to look. I just know they're required to teach it, to infuse it into all of their classes from K to 12. Okay. We did have a requirement in the bill that everyone in high school take it, take an ethnic studies course from ninth to 12th grade. At some point, you have to take an ethnic studies course. That did get taken out. I should check again to see if it got put back in, but it did get taken out last I heard because the Department of Ed just thought it was going to be a mess for them to make a new graduation requirement. <laughs> I, I, I saw that in, in Minnesota, even though I believe it's the St. Paul public school system that has that requirement. So in order to graduate high school from St. I believe it's St. Paul public schools, you do have to take high school students have to take an ethnic studies course. But I wonder then, which is worse off in California or Minnesota. I mean, I'm leaning more towards Minnesota because ethnic studies pedagogy, critical ethnic studies pedagogy then is being infused in every subject. Oh. K through 12, mm -hmm. it seems. Yeah, they were going to do that K through 12 and make it a required class. And now they're just doing K through 12, which is worse than California. If California yeah. is just doing, um, yeah, if California is just doing the ninth one class in high school to, I mean, and, and they were already, as you could see from a lot of the examples I gave, like some teachers were infusing it, but now it will be a requirement. They will have to show that they are actually teaching it and in classes kindergarten through 12th grade. And I just think about a kindergartner up in the Iron Range, Northern Minnesota in this all white area, learning about this, having maybe never met a person of color, learning that wealth should be taken from them and their family and given to a person of color. I mean, I just think it would create resentment, backlash, anger, not understanding why you have to just take something that you've earned and give it to somebody else. I just think it's gonna be very harmful. So hopefully my last question i've been talkative i'm sorry jen no no i only have one more question myself and it might be more towards you so so go for it <laughs> okay so possibly my last question but i reserve the right i'm not an attorney i don't know how you say it <laughs> is radical ethnic studies racist yes it is racist because it assumes it makes assumptions based on on race about people, like by saying that we're gonna be stuck in a lower caste system just because of the color of our skin, not looking at our character, who we are, how smart we are, whatever. So yes, I think it's racist. It tells white kids that they are in, that they are um, that they are racist just because of the color of their skin. So yes, I think it is, I think it is racist. I mean, it, it says here that institutional racism, that's another definition I didn't read to you, but it says anything that produces outcomes that chronically favor white people and disadvantage those who are black, indigenous, and people of color. So yes, I think it is, it's racist. My question is not as fun as Brandy's. <laughs> no, we want to end on it, but, and Brandy, this might be something that you can answer as well. Yeah, you know, we see it happening in California and now in Minnesota. Is there something particular to Minnesota, Kofi, that you feel that has really attracted this type of ideology i mean i kind of get it in california but I, minnesota I'm, I'm 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 unfamiliar with is there something in particular that you can get, be like this is why it's really hitting here in minnesota versus say i don't know virginia well i mean it's republicans some republicans or conservative people get behind this stuff too but it's mostly people who are Democrat and our state now has a trifecta of control by Democrats. And so this time they just ran through whatever they wanted unchallenged. But I also think because of George Floyd um, mm, happened right. here in Minnesota, right. it's yeah. just been a hotbed mm. for white people feeling incredibly guilty, even though there's no evidence he was killed for his skin color. At all you know he should not have been killed that was a terrible thing that happened but there's no evidence it was because of his skin color they have said it is because of his skin color they made that up they feel incredibly guilty and they're doing whatever they can to make themselves feel better and so i think that those reasons are why it's so hot in minnesota and i think there's a in general minnesota tries 
to be cool, I guess, in the middle. Like we're always trying to pattern everything after California and New York for <laughs> <laughs> like in COVID, they lock down, we'll lock down. They do this, we'll do this. Like and we're trying to like um we have an inferiority complex and we're trying to be as hip as California. So we have voted Democrat more than California, more than any other state. So I think it's uh you wouldn't think we were as progressive as California, but we are, if you call that progressive. <laughs> right. And good point. It reminded me, I, I, I had forgotten that George, you know, the George Floyd mur murder was in. Minnesota and a lot too, of so that. And, and Philando Castillo. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've had some shootings of Black people who that have gone viral that have been in Minnesota. So they, yeah. It's a kind of a, a hot, I don't know if you heard about Kimberly, Kim Potter, she was a police officer that pulled out her gun instead of her taser. And they mm -hmm. said that was because she hates black people. Even though the black guy driving the car, there was another black officer in the car being drunk. He was driving away and the black officer being drunk. And that is why she pulled out her gun to save the black officer. But she's a racist. So she actually did time in jail for that. Um, so we've had a lot of high profile things happen in Minnesota. And so the white people feel absolutely terrible. So they are going to do whatever it takes to virtue signal and do things that actually harm people of color instead of help them in the end, just to make themselves feel better. Do you have any plans to, I mean, I, I feel that you're going to continue to be active when these issues come up. Is there anything coming up right now that you see on the horizon that you are kind of gearing up for? Mm, no, not really. We're we're running for we're, there's a lot of different uh, school uh, candidates that have similar beliefs as me on this ethnic studies and race issue, and they were running tons of them for office. I think last year, sixty of them got into office. This year, we're running you know probably over a hundred for the different school board races. So these people are running contested. So I think that will help to at least put a stalemate in some cases in school boards where they're challenged and, and these things don't just pass unanimously anymore. So that gives me um, some hope. So that's on the horizon. That's just something practical that I'm working on. And I just have hope because my kid tells me that the kids are rebelling against the stuff that the teachers and the schools have gotten so extreme that the kids are now laughing at them and think it's absolutely ridiculous. And they refuse to live by this. And that is why my son, who's actually very quiet, and his friend, who's Chinese, who's also very quiet, they spoke up in class. They're sick of it. And so the recording I have um, of the band teacher is from some other guy's Asian child who recorded it. You know, it just shows the kids are mad. They're like, I'm recording this. I'm bringing this home to my parents. I am upset about this. I'm not tolerating this anymore. So it, that is what gives me hope, is that the younger generations are waking up and they don't they don't buy all of this stuff. Brandy, any last questions? <laughs> no, I mean, I think that's a, a good, uh, actually a, a hopeful part to, to yeah. end. Uh, you know, I, I think that really focusing on, on kids that, that are not just experiencing this in the classroom, but that who have the most to lose by being, yeah, I, I always talk about kids are being, being made the rope in this partisan tug of war and the mm -hmm. people are, the group there that gets harmed would be the kids. They have, mm -hmm. and if they're rejecting radical ideology and, and they're approaching this rationally, let's hope that, you know, the adults maybe start listening to them and learn something from the, the younger generations. Yeah, I think, yeah, I you was, know, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Coco. Oh, I was going to say that, I remember what you're going to say, but I wasn't so bright, like as my kid, because I, in college, when I had my socialist professor tell me all the white people sucked, I actually internalized it and I got really depressed. I cried a lot and I didn't want to be friends with my white friends anymore because I thought they were racist because that's what I was told. How can you get up and tell kids all white people are white supremacists and then not expect them to be, to think their friends are white supremacists? Like that's what happened to me. So I, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it has a logical conclusion. It has like a, an impact, a real impact on people's lives sometimes. So I'm thankful that a lot of these kids are waking up and didn't it didn't have the effect that it had on me. I was just gonna say, I'm wondering, I know some organizations like Parents Defending Education, FIRE, they've got student groups 
that fight for like, for example, fire for, you know, free expression. I wonder, Kofi, you maybe in Minnesota is take charge. Have they thought about doing something like that, organizing around the students as much as they do around parents, perhaps? Fair has thought of that. Have you heard of Fair Foundation yeah. Against mm -hmm. Racism and Intolerance? They have student group chapters. And I do think that's a great idea that we would encourage students to do that support them in that so that they feel supported and not feel right. they don't feel so lonely right at school dealing with this stuff because it's yeah it's hard as a student when you're afraid you're going to get punished by your teacher if you speak out mm -hmm. so i do think getting more student groups um would be helpful yeah and letting the kids know they also won't be suspended <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> That's a double-edged sword. No, there's no suspension. So. Yeah. <laughs> no, kids. So. <laughs> well, Kobe, thank you so much for your time and, and sharing your story and just for the, the courage that you have to, to speak out, not just with us, but, you know, with the legislation within the school boards themselves, too. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks, Kofi. I appreciate it. And I uh, speaking with us and speaking out and everything that you're doing, I think an involved parent is the best thing, you know, our kids can have. So thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.